Do you have it? Try it, Mokuba. Good. If I may speak freely, sir, I'm not entirely certain why you're treating the matter of a cellular telephone with such gravity. Surely young Mokuba is trustworthy enough to use such a device responsibly? You seem as though you were giving him a weapon. The thought crossed my mind more than once. Let us just say that my motivations for this are less than joyous. Listen to me, Mokuba. I'm not going to place any restrictions on how often you use this phone, so long as it does not present a problem. But I want you to heed me on this one thing, okay? The number you've just entered is not to be used regularly. Am I understood? Oh, uh, okay. Roll in cellular number is for emergencies. Do you understand? Emergencies requiring immediate attention. Call his office number, or my personal number if you need assistance with something mundane. If Copeland is late picking you up, or you need a ride somewhere, if we're out of ice cream... Roland, if that phone rings, treat it as a grave emergency. I don't care if it's midnight, if you're vomiting blood, or if you're taking your grandmother to the hospital. If Mokuba calls that phone, assume he is dying. If you find that Mokuba's phone is turned off at a time it should be on, assume he is dying. Do you understand me? Of course, sir. Do you understand, Mokuba? Why shouldn't I call you? I don't always answer this stupid thing. You would be surprised how many homeschool hackers think themselves clever and dig up that number. It's a safety precaution. So call that number if you need immediate assistance, but for no other reason, all right? Yes, Nisma. And true to his word, as he almost always was, Mokuba took his brother's instructions seriously. Mokuba had never called Roland's cellular phone for anything outside of an emergency. He did not call immediately upon discovering his current situation, but he eventually would. Roland did not discover the problem until he checked the location of the Kaiba Corp limousine, finding it not at Kaiba Manor, but halfway across the city. He tried to call Makuba's phone. It went straight to voicemail. And with that, his face paled. Oh, hell. But if you just look at these figures... I've looked at them, Grigo, and it is not going to happen. That's the key element to the product in the first place, Grigo. I have standards. I don't run a toy company. I run a gaming company. And these... This design you're showing me is not something I want my name on. I was told that you were interested foremost in profit. Are you denying that this would be profitable? No, I am not. You're likely right that this would work out well, but that is beside the point. This corporation has a reputation, Grigo, and I'm not so desperate that I would jump at any chance at profit. I can afford not to. This corporation can afford not to. If you insist on pushing this idea, then keep it with you. And if I come to a point where I- Mr. Kaiba! The little one. Leave it on the desk! Little what? How sweet little master, you remember me. Couldn't forget you, I tried. Adashi Sarwatari wasn't a man easily forgotten. If forced to guess, Mokuba thought that that was part of the reason he had made it into Seto's employee in the first place. Seto had been younger when he had hired this man, and more confident in his ability to intimidate. Surely Seto had thought having a man of almost 7 feet and 300 pounds of corded steel as a bodyguard would make an impression. He thought that by placing Mokuba under the protection of a behemoth like Saruwatari, no one would dare to touch him. And he also thought that he had done a good enough job of proving his superiority over the man that he was well under control. For one of only a handful of times in his life, Seto has been sorely mistaken. As in turnout, so had Mokuba. 
who had thought he'd never see the man again. When Pegasus Crawford, Sarah Watery's real employer, had gone down, thanks in no small part to Yugi Modo, Sarah Watery had dropped off the face of the planet. Until now, apparently. <laughs> ah, yes, I forgot what a treat you were, little master. You're a quick one, aren't you? So, how have you been? Fine. How was life in Mexico, Gorilla Face? <laughs> Such wit! Ah, but you are a rare breed, little master. How is your esteemed sibling doing, then? I've not seen him in some time. Don't have to ask me. You'll see him again pretty soon. Ask him yourself. <laughs> oh, I'm sure I will see him soon. I'm quite sure. He was a rare man. Not so rare on the surface. There were plenty of cops in Domino City, and plenty of good ones. Plenty of those good cops had moved on from fieldwork to a detective's desk, just like he had. And plenty of those detectives were on the captain's good side, just like he was. He was a relatively young man, 34, a good age, a solid age. He was 6 feet 7, well-muscled and well-trained. He fit in well with the younger generation of what were sometimes jokingly called dominions, because he did not clutch at authority. He didn't wear his badge like a crown, nor did he wave his sidearm like a scepter. He dressed relatively casually for a police detective, often in simple slacks and a button-down shirt, sometimes a jacket but never a tie. And he wore his hair short and spiked. He looked like a college student much more often than he did a law enforcement officer. And while it was certain that some of the older members of the Domino City Police Department disapproved, he liked it and had done a fine enough job in his years of service that nobody pushed the issue. These traits may have made him unusual, but none of them made him rare. What made this man rare was that he, and he alone, could confidently call himself a family friend of the Kaibas. And so, it was this man, Detective Darren McKinley, who received a phone call from Roland Ackerman on the afternoon of September 9th, and as luck would have it, the detective had been on his way home. McGinley. Detective, I'm calling you because you're the only person he'll trust. We've never met, but my name is Roland Ackerman. I am Master Seto Kaiba's personal assistant his right hand, if you want to be romantic about it. Seto, what's this about, Mr. Ackerman? Does he need something? Oh yes, indeed, he does. I've called in our own security, but we need the police department working on this as well. This is why I called. We have to move quickly. We have reason to believe that young Master Mokuba is missing. What? Do you mean... Has he been taken? What do we know? Sadly little, I'm afraid. But I have learned not to take matters of disrupted routine lightly in my time with this family. Master Kaiba is bound to lose his head. The longer this goes on, we have to be swift to assess the true nature of the situation. Can I count on your help, Detective McKinley? Yes. Yes, of course. Where should I meet you? Master Kaiba is on his way to Oakwood Elementary School. This is where the little one was last seen. Do you know the way? My daughter went there. I know it. Good. Thank you, Detective. Uh, what? Yes, sir. Of course. Detective? Sento. Don't call in backup for this. Why? You know why. This game isn't new to me, Darren. Whoever has done this will contact me soon, and I will be ordered not to involve the police. You sound pretty sure of that. It's what I would do. Meet me at the school, Darren. We have to move fast. <sighs> What is it? I... I don't understand. Perhaps I am simply ignorant, sir, on the current methods for child abduction, but... I thought for certain that the kidnapper would at least... 
use another vehicle. What are you talking about? Are you trying to tell me that we're dealing with such an idiot that he actually took Mokuba in our own limousine? Yes, sir. Exactly. It's headed toward the freeway, on Wilkins Avenue, just past South Cherokee. They have been moving for some time, but it's right here. McKinley, find something, Seto? Already? Roland's located the limousine. We're headed after it. On the chance that this is a red herring, keep heading for Mokuba's school. See if anyone actually saw this idiot in the act. Will do, Seto. I'm almost there. Hey, how did you find out this happened? Did you get a call? Not a call. A sign. From Mokuba. If you're asking if we know for certain what's happened here, no. But I know enough. Didn't he get out of school something like 15, 20 minutes ago? Do we know why he wouldn't call? Even for a couple of seconds to make sure you knew? If the suspect actually is using your limo to skip down... Wouldn't he have taken Mokuba straight from school? He would have known rather quickly that something was wrong. I'm not sure. Probably. I'll see what I can find. Good. Darren? Yes? Thank you. This is my job, Sento. And I haven't done anything yet. Let's just make sure the kid gets home safely, huh? Then you can talk about thanking me. Right. Tris and I, we were waiting at the KC building. You know that bowling alley out by Duke's place? I thought we'd head out there. Don't think the kid's ever been bowling before, so, you know. We were getting along pretty good with Mokuba by then. He's a good kid. I wasn't sure about the whole thing at first, but he warms up on you, you know? But I was still a bit out of it. I guess waiting around Kaiba's place. I didn't want to be there. Taya seems about to say something. Probably I don't blame you, but Yugi touched her arm to silence her. She glanced at them, then back at the others and didn't speak. Tristan seemed somewhat guilty to be admitting this, and it was clear by her face that she didn't think he should be. She looked like she wanted to say something comforting, but she didn't. So anyway, Kaiba said that he needed Mokuba to head out there for something. Don't know what, some vice president thing. But it wouldn't take long, and then he'd have Copland, as their driver, take us out. I've never been in a limo, except for this one time when I was, uh... Six? Six. I was kinda excited, you know? Antsy. I kept wondering what was taking Mokuba so long. Twenty minutes feels a lot longer when you're waiting on something. Something struck Taya Garner at that moment. As she listened, she realized that this was the first time she could remember seeing Joey Wheeler looking like this. She had seen a wide range of emotion from the blonde before, but the expression on his face now was something alien. It wasn't just somber, it wasn't just sad, it wasn't just frightened or angry, it was haunted. For the first time, Taya realized that Joey wasn't seeing her. He wasn't seeing the Turtle Game Shop, or Tristan or Yugi or anything else about his current location. What he was seeing right now was something Taya couldn't fathom. And looking at Joey's face, she realized she was glad that, that she couldn't. It scared her. And Taya saw something even more shocking than before. Joey Wheeler was on the verge of tears. When I got the call from Kaiba telling us to go home because Mokuba had been kidnapped again, going home was the last thing I wanted to do. I said, no, where are you? I'm coming to help, damn it. And Kaiba said, fine, probably to get off the phone quicker. But I still didn't feel too, you know, scared for him yet. I mean, it's happened tons of times already, right? Kid's probably used to it by now. Eh, not this. None of us could have ever been prepared for this. 